The Dharma, incomparably profound and exquisite, has rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands of millions of countless. We now can see it, hear it, accept and hold it. May we realize the true man, mind of the Tathagata. Today is the first day of this October 2022 Sashin, seven day Sashin as all of our Sashins these days are. And it's a kind of a chilly day. Winter is clearly coming. Uh, it's been raining a lot, which is quite wonderful for northern New Mexico. And we have broken some records, I believe, in terms of the amount of rainfall, which is great because we have been in an extended drought, serious, serious drought. And it's odd that the rest of the country, at least the rest of the Southwest, appears to be in a, in a very serious drought with lakes drying up, rivers drying up. Uh, I just read that the Mississippi River is so low now that uh, barges that normally transport goods up and down the river are uh, impeded and that is having more impact on the supply chain challenges. Lots of stuff going on these days. Periodically in history, these kinds of things happen, uh, almost as if um, there's an enormous dust storm thrown up for extended periods of time, uh, challenging people to, uh, well, hopefully to free themselves. But not everybody has a connection for a way to do this. We are most fortunate that we ourselves are able to have this Zazen practice, especially with this extended outbreath called Sasokan, that can bring us to a place of such utter freedom that even if we're in the midst of that insanity, we maintain our sanity, our grounded beingness, and are free from being negatively impacted by it. There were many Zen masters over the centuries who lived in very traumatizing periods. Uh, there is the what is known as the Golden Age of Zen, where some of the greatest Chinese Zen masters, Chan masters, uh, came forth. And it was a period of great persecution of Zen, of wars, of uh, all kinds of unrest in, in China. And I'd like to share with you today something in the story of uh, a man, kind of an iconoclast, called Ikyu Sojun. Ikyu was a monk, and he was uh, known to be the love child of a very young emperor, 17-year-old emperor at the time with of Japan with one of his concubines, a 16 year old. Um, she seems to have been a, at the time there were Northern and Southern factions in Japan. And she came from the South, he was in the North. She was a gift to the court um, as, as a kind of um, tribute. Uh, back then marriages and relationships all over the world and even now, I suspect as well, uh, have taken place as a result of political um, efficiency. And so it was with uh, Ikyu's mom. But there was a lot of jealousy in the court, and so she was banned. He was born in a suburb of Kyoto. She and he were banned to a place where they sent concubines that weren't in favor anymore uh, in Saga, which is now uh, pretty much a, almost a part of Kyoto. Things change, countries expand, cities expand. And um, he, his life was always in danger since he was the first son, apparently, of Go Komatsu, the emperor, Go Komatsu, then his life was in danger because there were factions who didn't really want him 
to eventually uh, become emperor. So he was sent at the age of five to a monastery, a Rinzai Buddhist monastery, to be trained as a monk. If he's a monk, there's no competition. He's not going to become an emperor. He's out of the running. And, uh, and so it was a safer place for him to be. He learned the, the, this particular monastery, and I, I should say something about the, the Buddhism of the era in Japan, was pretty degraded. Periodically, every religion goes through periods of time where it rises out of the ashes, so to speak, and is genuine and deep. And then over time, greed and power come forth and, and various religions uh, get cloaked in fancy outfits and fancy titles and begin to lose track largely um, in the actual spiritual practices of that religion. And it happens with, with Buddhism as well. When Hakuin was uh, a young man, the same thing was going on in Japan. There were no real masters other than, apparently, uh, his, the one teacher he did find who was genuine, um, the old man of, of uh, well, Rojin is the old man of the monastery, tiny little monastery that's so tiny that it was really uh, the size of a farmer's cottage, which a farmer's cottage was very small. Um, it would fit, the whole thing would fit in the zendo, <coughs> including the decks. And um, Shoju Rojin, the old man of Shoju Hermitage, was a genuine teacher. <coughs> And that made a difference for Hakuin and all the way down to us. <coughs> Excuse me. So EQ was another another one at uh, of a similar era. He spent uh, several years uh, until he was 13 <coughs> in that monastery learning Chinese poetry, classic Chinese poetry, Chinese culture, Chinese uh, being able to read and write in Chinese, uh, was, which was the lingua franca of the Buddhist clergy at the time, since Buddhism had come from China. And initially, the Chinese teachers who came to Japan communicated with their Japanese students in the written language, because in those days, the, they were decipherable. They were, the, the Japanese language uh, consists of, in part, Chinese characters. Over the centuries, both written languages have diverged and simplified, so it's not quite as easy anymore, but <clears throat> in the 1100s, it was. And even today, um, Zen masters uh, create poems in the Chinese uh, way of doing it and in the Chinese characters that are part of Japanese written language. So he learned how to do that. Um, and then when he was 13, he went to another temple. Um, it was sent as an acolyte uh, 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 and um, ultimately to be ordained. And he only stayed there briefly, and then went to another temple and stayed until he was 16. But he was so disheartened and disgusted by the uh, prevalence of greed and uh, power in the in the in the temples of the time, and this happened also with Dogen in China, 
Uh, if you watch the movie Zen, which is a Japanese uh, movie, a documentary really, on Dogen's life, because since Dogen was Japanese, and it has subtitles in English, and you'll see that at a certain point he was at a Chinese temple and and uh, left because the the head of the temple was simply currying favor with with supporters so that he could survive. This is the flavor of Zen many times over the centuries, and it was the same in Iku's time. There's another thread. Uh, in the, at least the Japanese primary Zen masters. We don't know that much about the early lives of the Chinese ones, but the early lives of the Japanese ones, uh, Ikkyu being sent off when he was five, um, there was probably some level of sorrow in the family, uh, both at the separation of his mom from the, the man that she loved and he with her, and also being sent for his own safety to become a monk. The, and Dogen, who was three when his father died, and eight when his mother died. Hakuin didn't have uh, his parents dying. However, he had something else that was internal, which was an, an incredible fear of hell, falling into hell. So these things motivated, motivated these men who became great Zen masters. Ikkyu finally found a Zen master for whom he was a single student and ended up with a, a, a Kensho through that master. But the master died when he was 21. I think his name was Ken O. Oh. And so he, he was profoundly saddened by that passing and, however, eventually found another similar master who actually taught in the same way and had uh, supposedly only had one other student. Uh, and it's famous that EQ would go and spend the night in a boat. The master's temple was on the, lake, on the edge of the Lake Biwa, which is a large lake in Japan very famous lake and he would borrow a, f a fisherman's boat and go out and sit in the boat all night long and doing his azen. He ended up being passed on a koan with his first real teacher Kenno and uh, but then Kenno died as I said and this this second teacher uh, one time he was out there in the boat and he heard a crow call and it triggered a very deep awakening experience for him. And he was, he was considered a Dharma successor of that man. However, he was not made the head temple uh, successor. There was a more senior monk, that, that other monk, who Iku disdained because he felt like he was, quote, selling Zen uh, to support the temple um, and really the implication being abandoned real teaching. So Iku went off on his own. He's famous, as I said, as being, as being uh, quite the icon iconoclast. Uh, he lived freely uh, and uh, complained a great deal about the condition of uh, the higher-ups in Zen temples back then, including uh, the sub-temple sub of Daitokuji, where, she, where he was training briefly before he went to meet Ken O. And he's famous for um, going into the brothels and, and for drinking and for otherwise living a life that was not exactly the example of a Buddhist monk, but he also was free in a very, very deep way. And he was not caught in any needs for prestige or for being, for fitting in a role or any other things that we human beings get caught in. He spent a great deal of time writing poetry, 
he had learned how to do that. Uh, and he's, he was actually starting to do it when he was 13 <clears throat> and <laughs> using his poetry at the time uh, when he was in, I believe it was Kenninji, which still is a teaching temple in Kyoto. By the way, Ikkyu was born in 1394, long time ago. But he, he is famous for his poetry. He's also famous for when he was in his 70s, um, living with a blind woman who he was in love with. He died at 87 and lived through what are known as the Onin Wars or the Onin War. The Onin War, again, as wars are, was started through uh, a power play and extended into all sorts of sub power plays and ended up I didn't, it ended up only because after 10 years, everybody was so tired of fighting. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, lots of places, including the city of Kyoto were, were destroyed. There were peasant uprisings. There were all kinds of clan splits and uh, subterfuges and, and uh, all of this over the fact that there was a an emperor who had no heir at the time. And so he talked his brother who had gone into the monkhood, who was a Buddhist monk, he talked him into leaving the monkhood in order to succeed him in, in, uh, as emperor. And then that's where it all started. There were factions. And then suddenly, uh, unexpectedly, <laughs> there was an heir and the the pregnant mom was interested in becoming regent and having her side of the 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 family uh become emperor with her with her child being becoming emperor not sure how they knew back then that this would be a little boy but at any rate uh wars start over the most amazing things so IQ lived during a time not so different from ours. And as I was reading about the Onin Wars, I was thinking of how similar our own current political situation is with one side trying to get the power, the other side trying to get the power, all kinds of things going on uh, in the meantime, lawsuits and all kinds of stuff like that. Um, I don't think they had lawsuits back then in the in the 1400s, but perhaps they did. Uh, but it's not so different from Ikkyu's time. It's not so different from the golden age of Zen. So Ikkyu became profoundly awakened and lived a life freely. He was poor. He, he finally ended up in his 70s, late 70s, early 80s, um, being called to Daitokuji to rebuild it because it had been destroyed during the Onin War. And he did reluctantly become its abbot and oversaw the re rebuilding of Daitokuji. But other than that, he really didn't head any temples and was had, had no interest in heading any temples. The world is full of greed, anger, and the delusion that there is something to gain. Through our Zen practice, we begin to realize how much of this is illusion, how much of our own life is illusion. And as we begin to gain insights into this through our Zen practice, we begin to become free of those illusions. It takes a very long time and a great deal of commitment to reach that point where we are free enough that even modern politics, uh, while we may enjoy the show or have a, a position on one side or the other, 
it's, it's not a major disaster. Somehow it'll all come out one way or the other. Yasutani Roshi, when asked by someone, uh, must have been around the Korean conflict because uh, he was asked if, uh, you know, how, how, how could humanity survive an atom bomb? And of course there was an atom bomb, more than one atom bomb dropped on Japan, which ended the Second World War. But uh, somebody was quite afraid that there would be another one and for a long time there has been fear. And even now there's uh, a saber rattling uh, president of, of Russia who is threatening nuclear war. And the person asked, you know, what would happen if, uh, if somebody dropped a bomb? And Yastani Roshi said, well, you would perforce become one with it. When we don't resist what comes to us in our life, when like Harada Roshi said, we receive, openly receive, allow ourselves to receive what comes, then there is no hindrance in responding in the most appropriate and most helpful and most liberating ways. This is what our Zen practice can offer us. Ikkyu was able to do that. Hakuin eventually himself was able to do that. Many, many, many human beings, even contemporary human beings like, like Flora Courtois, like Jacques Le Terran, and countless other unnamed human beings have been able to reach that clarity of mind that allows for the most innate freedom beyond imagination. And then we are able to respond to whatever circumstances we find ourselves in because there is no internal resistance. There's no internal framework that says you have to do it this way, you have to do it that way. And EQ's behavior is an example of that. He was condemned by many people for um, loving his women and loving his wine, even though he was a Buddhist monk. We don't know the exact details about that, but in some ways he was expressing a number of things that perhaps some people were caught too much in that framework of how we should behave. And I'm not suggesting that we go out and run naked in the streets because we might feel like it, although it's kind of cold to do that right now. Uh, but uh, there is an innate freedom built in if we allow ourselves to stretch our boundaries, to not be cramped by a self-created framework. It is quite amazing how we can live and be free, even in the midst of challenge, even if we feel that the wrong party is, is gaining ground and we may lose all kinds of things as a result of it that we feel are essential in life, we will still be able to live in a way that is peaceful and free. And to do our best work in helping right the situation if it gets uh, turned over. So the Zen practice holds the key to this, to give ourselves over and over and over again to the extended out breath and the reaching for what is beyond ordinary thought, ordinary knowledge, but is real. And perhaps the only real reality there is. Of course it's difficult. Doing susokan it's not an easy thing to do initially, or even, even perhaps even for several years. But it's not an easy thing to do because we're caught up in other stuff. 
We're invested in other ways of being, mostly like thinking. And that is actually a subterfuge of the mind to avoid becoming free. Yes, it's important to rally for uh, appropriate causes. Yes, it's, support, it's appropriate to live your most compassionate life. But the more we get out of our way, the more that can unfold. And the only way I know to get out of the way is through this deepening Zen practice and the most impactive practice is the extended out breath because it, it cuts through attachments. And if we are having difficulty with it, it's because we are clinging to our attachments. It's a, it can be a frightening thing to do, to let go, particularly from, for anyone who's had a difficult life. Uh, when we have challenge in our life, whether it's trauma or other difficulties, we want to maintain some level of control. And to do susokan is to let go of control. Because we're letting go of the stuff that interferes in our living with living fully, clearly, cleanly, cleanly. And that's why it's so difficult. But persist, persist, and it will make such an enormous difference. Not only in your life, but in the life of all beings. So I thank you for listening. We'll stop now and recite the four vowels, and there's still uh, almost 20 minutes left here. So 